third time's a charm, long time uh, in the works conversation with Joey Bright and Mr. Menno. So thank you both for uh, being here. And I also just wanna say that this is the first time that I've had a man on my channel. And it's it man, you. man. <laughs> <laughs> well, no pressure then. All right, I'll, I'll try and keep it polite. It's happening, but but the reason for that is well. First of all, I I you know we've we've met before in a different context for the conference that um, Alex organized, the Gender Offender Mapper, and um, also because we're going to be talking about sexuality today and so mm. yes so it felt fitting to have this conversation with so me being a heterosexual woman joey being a lesbian and menno being a gay man right we're gonna, an actual homosexual an actual homo yeah we have two actual homosexuals in the house today yeah N not people who identify as homosexuals but people who are homosexuals Precisely. So I guess also it's kind of funny that when we originally had planned to speak, it was right before the super gay, super straight phenomena, Is right? Yes. It was right yes. before that. And so I think this conversation is very timely. And so maybe we could even chat about that. Um, have either of you been involved directly in those hashtags? Have you been posting? Have you made any content around super straight, super gay? Um, there were some people online and they were saying, oh, Mr. Menno, you need to do a song about this. And quite a few of them suggested uh, the song Super Freak. Super Freak, Super Freak, she's super freaky. Um, but somebody else beat me to it. Uh, and good for them because they did a, a really good job. So, uh, oh, what's the name? Actually Karen. 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 The Karen. YouTube channel is Actually Karen or Karen Actually. One of the others, but yeah, she did. She did a great job. So that was great to see. And I guess what I what I liked what I liked was just how much fun people were having with that, mm -hmm. and how they used it to turn everything upside down. That's been turned upside down for us. So I guess they turned it back how it how it, how it how it was meant to be. I guess. Um, so they had to have their own flag, their own hashtag, super straight. You know, and you can't question it. You can't be super phobic. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. What did you think, Joey? Well, what I did was I went on to TikTok because I had heard that this thing was going on TikTok. And I started looking immediately just as TikTok started to censor all these guys. And this right. one that I really liked, I po popped out my camcorder and, you know, I brought it up on my laptop. I, I filmed it. And then he did get he got canceled like within hours or something after i did that so i put it up on my can i get a witness channel and had okay. it had it up there for a bit and it started getting a lot of views you know i was sort of passing it around it was very subversive it's the kind of verse that i really really like i think that it's just another angle of how to get people to think about things but then my channel got that's another story for another time but um my entire channel got just wiped out by Vimeo because of one video that I had put up this past week. And there went the super straight guy. It was my, it was my favorite of all the ones that I had seen. And he was of course doing a split, like a split thing of himself and then a trans activist who was- Yes, that was him. the black guy with the blue wig, right? Yes, and he was trying, his yeah. character was trying to force shame on, on the straight character that he played. Yeah. Saying, well, you know, you can't just make up, you just can't make up a sexuality and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, yes, I can. Right. And then he said, well, that makes you a transphobe. And the guy goes, okay. And then <laughs> the other guy yeah. falls apart and melts and it starts calling him, a, he's horrible and he's a bigot. And all the words that we see that I have just seen recently thrown at Isabella herself just for being who she is and talking about being a heterosexual woman. And this stuff with with sexuality you know it's been things that um we have been and i Menno and i've been friends for a while now and talking about this as as an issue i never thought in all the i mean i've been out for more than 40 years and to think that 
I was feeling happy and excited about this idea. And I know these straight people are happy to belong to a club now of some sort, you know, that feels yeah, yeah, yeah. minority in a way. And I just, now I just laugh at it and go, yeah, this is right. There was a guy on Facebook who started an LGBS page with the flag and the whole deal. And there's all these people coming in there. What's great about that are the conversations that I see happening because straight people that are gone for the super straight not necessarily politicized. They haven't been in a position necessarily where they have been really ostracized or even threatened or, you know, rape threats, death threats, that kind of stuff. And they're starting to open their minds to, oh, wow, this is the, it's like they're just finding out about JK Rowling and, you know, all that yeah. stuff. And these bridges are being built. It's not no longer just this idea of radical feminists working with the right wing it's bridges are right it, it, it disrupts in a fun way it disrupts the narrative yes um and even though i guess what it does though is that even though it's jokey it's like why do we have to justify mm -hmm. our sexuality or wh why do we now have to qualify what makes our sexuality okay because other people have different ideas of how things work and a good thing i think now is now it's bringing straight people into it because it's very easy for trans activists to shame gays and to shame lesbians and bisexuals because it's like, oh, but you're in our community, you know, you have to stick with us. Mm -hmm. It's like this, this stick that they have to beat us with, that they have, that they can beat us with. Um, but yeah, with straight people, they can't play that. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's a lot more straight people that, they, that can give them pushback than a smaller group of, of gays and lesbians. What's worrying about it is that the guy who started it all, just a teenager, mm. I think he, his mum got doxxed yeah. and they've both had death threats. Yes. Um, he's had his videos pulled by TikTok. When he put explainer videos on, on TikTok, you know, why he even did it, those got pulled. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, it's funny, but on the other hand, you see that very nasty side Mm -hmm. that comes straight back for you, comes straight back at you when you don't toe the line, you know, mm -hmm. when, when you don't beat the trans drone. What it comes back to is this kind of this sacredness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of our sexuality mm -hmm. and, and what it is mm -hmm. and how we don't want it to be appropriated. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm curious, you know, because I, I have plenty of stories of, you know, people accusing me, mostly actually exclusively women accusing me of transphobia for not wanting to sleep with women who identify as men. So I'm wondering uh, if each of you would share a story uh, about really the, the maybe the first time or one of the times you were accused of being transphobic for not wanting to have sex with the sex that you are not sexually attracted to. I could go with that real quickly. It has never happened to me. <laughs> Surprise! No, seriously, in my entire life, I've had uh, two men ever come on to me, and this is way before all of this stuff. And I was sort of, I was dumbfounded, you know, working in the trades. And uh, yeah, I was just so surprised, but I've been with lovers who have years ago got the question thrown to them about men, the men that were pretending to be not just women, but lesbians. Mm. And talking about that within the le what used to be the lesbian community and many women just, just going, you know, that's, that's, that's ridiculous. They're men. And it's, it was never a question. And something shifted, obviously, in the whole in the whole culture, because all of a sudden now, like when my friends in 2018 were attacked at the Dyke March, it was women that attacked them. And you look past their shoulders, and you can see it in some footage, and they have two men who are standing there with skirts on. But no, I've never been accused of uh, refusing to have sex or pressured to have sex with any men at all, because I've been mistaken. For it's, it seems so ridiculous. But uh -huh. Uh -huh. It depends on the geography of really where we are a lot and people and they're just their simple ignorance of never having seen 
a woman who looked like me or whatever, and particularly somebody who's in the trades for many years, you know, showing up in a, in a painting outfit or just trades clothes. So I haven't had that. Menno, have you ever been pressured into feeling? Um, well, th there's, it comes in more, more subtle ways as well, which I think are, are important things to recognize. I have been mistaken for a trans man myself by someone who identifies as a trans man. Um, and they said, they didn't even ask if I was trans. They just assumed and, oh my God. and ask. How did, they, how did that converse, can you just walk us through what that interaction was like? <laughs> oh my God. Like, oh, do you have any spare testosterone? Like I've just run out. It seems to really work. And then reaches you. down in his pants and says, I'll look for it here in my, <laughs> my ball sack. Stop it, Joey. Um, okay, all right. I went to a reading of a play. So this is a situation where a play hasn't been finished yet. The writing hasn't quite been finished. Uh, and they just get a bunch of actors together to read through it, have an audience and see how it goes down. And this actually was called Transcript. So it's a producer who passed away not that long ago, an American guy called Paul Lucas. He had interviewed about 50 people who identify as trans. Um, in this case, uh, men who identify as trans women and put together like a whole production verbatim, right? Using their stories. Um, initially, he'd asked me to maybe read one of the parts that didn't materialize, but I went to the reading and that's the first time I heard the word cis. Um, anyways, afterwards we went to the pub and then one of, one of them, a woman identifying as a, as a trans man, um, came up to me and just went almost in a flirtatious way, just kind of went, when did you transition? And I just went, what the, huh? <laughs> and then, uh, I, I said, I, I, I I never, no, I, I haven't. So then she said, oh, you're cis. Oh, that's the first time I heard cis. Um, and then she said this to me, which I thought was so bizarre. You're too pretty to have been born a boy. Which to me just made me think, well, who's, the, who's dealing in stereotypes here? Um, anyway, that was that. Um, what I wanted to say in terms of being pressured into being with, with a woman who identifies as a, as a trans man, um, that takes me back two years ago where I was with a group of gay men. And I thought it was interesting, um, Joey, what you said, or Isabella, that you said that those who accuse you of transphobia are women. The ones who accuse me of transphobia are mostly gay men. So I was having a chat with a, a few gay guys in a pub and then uh, we were, th the trans thing came up. And then one of them got really very aggressive with me when all I said was that, you know, people who are, you know, who, who identify as trans, they don't agree with one another about what trans is. So how can we? Um, and then he asked me this question. He said, are you saying that trans men aren't real men? And this is like a trick, right? He uses the word real men that puts you in a really weird position because if you say well no they're not real men straight away you're the bigot and the transphobe but also by him using the word real if i was to say yes they are real men i'm straight away denying what it is that makes me a man mm -hmm. because when i when i say i'm a man that's not who i am that's what i am mm -hmm. but if i say that a woman can be a man then obviously that, that means you need to shift what it means to be a man. Mm -hmm. And no, I'm not willing to give that up. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily come in, um, oh, you must have sex with a trans man. Cause, but it, it's much more subtle than that. And because of that more insidious, if you see what I mean, the way they try to get us to buy into it and to coerce us into into complying with it. Mm -hmm. That's what I think is so dangerous that even this guy says to me, are you saying they're not real men? Mm -hmm. And didn't you tell me, Menno, that recently getting on even Tinder, 
that there are a number of these women who think that they're not just men, but that they're gay men and they're actually putting up Grindr. profiles and friends. I don't know if you've had any friends be tricked by any of that or? Um, I don't know about the tricking. Um, I do know situations where uh, other guys have told me, other gay men, that, you know, in Berlin, there's like a, a sex club. So that's where gay men go to have sex. Mm -hmm. And there's one particular person in, in Berlin, a uh, female who identifies as a, as a gay man. I mean, just saying that is absurd. Just saying that is ab it's absolutely absurd. A female identifying as a gay man who goes into that space. And obviously, if you were to say, oh, we don't really like you in here with your vagina, you can't because it's transphobic. So again, it's, it's this coercion element of it that I find very disturbing. And uh, we've had similar situations in gay saunas. Again, you know, gay men mm. don't necessarily go to the gay sauna for the steam room. They go for a bit of house your father, yeah. <laughs> as they yeah. would say. Um, so if you then have somebody, you know, who's had a double mastectomy and they have a vagina, you know, as, as, as wonderful and magical as vaginas are, that's not what I want to see. If I go to a, a space where you want to be intimate mm -hmm. with men, mm -hmm. not people who buy into the idea of men or who perform men. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine if I'm in a situation like that and um, Alan Page shows up. And obviously now with the whole trans thing, it doesn't matter whether you are even on testosterone or not. It doesn't, you know, because trans is everything and anything. So if, if a female comes in who still has her breasts and has a vagina, you know, obviously, even if she, if she had a so-called penis fashioned out of her, this, a flap of skin from her arm, that's not a penis. So I haven't had that thrown in my face, excuse the pun, but other people have, and it's like, whoa, I've gone off on one a bit. <laughs> Isabel, if you want to pull me back. Well, <laughs> Does that make sense? I'd like yeah. to say something in that you said, Menno. It's interesting, again, because it has to do with experience and years and whatnot. And I think, Isabella, you'd find this interesting, again, because you're the youngest of the crew here. But I've talked with people about this a long time, that pre, a long time ago, that pre-internet, if you wrote a letter to an editor, you'd be lucky if it got published and maybe it, it happened a week or two weeks after you would write the letter to talk about something else that somebody brought up. There was a gay man in San Francisco and I'll never forget this. And, and we're talking, this is the, in the nineties who wrote a letter to the editor and you know, the Castro district of San Francisco has long been you know, renowned for being not just a gay Mecca, but I mean a very serious gay mecca for, for men and uh, sex clubs and dance halls and all kinds of things. This man wrote in and said, I'm just putting it out there. I'm sick to death of going to my sex club and having a vagina in my face. And he just said that and I read that and I went, yeah, I get what he's talking about. Women, instead of the transphobia, because it wasn't really a word that had started being thrown out, it wasn't anything like that. All these women wrote in and said he was misogynist. He hated women. Yeah. They went yeah. and they, they went and attacked him. And then I took another week. And I wrote in his defense. I wrote in his defense and I broke it down. Of course, none of this stuff even exists online anymore to see. But I remember this thing dragging out for about three weeks. But he got attacked. And I never did meet that guy. But there was the thing of recognizing sex sex as a thing, as a reality, the smell, the feel, the everything that we have talked about, the chemicals that go on between people, how important that is. I'm glad you brought that up. I was just thinking about, yeah, the pheromones and the, the kind of confusion. Because I remember, I remember having a, actually a boss um, uh, at a, a kind of a retail job that I worked briefly in New York City. And uh, I remember being attracted to this person, like on a surface level, um, and then later finding out that they were a woman mm. and feeling super, super confused. And what I was attracted to was the kind of like painting, 
like the surface image of this individual. Mm -hmm. But had it gone one step further, you know, like had, had we been like sexually in contact, my mm. body would immediately know mm. that something was off. Mm. And by, by something being off, I mean that this was not a man. We as humans know the difference between men and women. You know, I've heard the experience <coughs> of transitioned women who will say, you know, I was only ever attracted to straight men. Well, that's a really difficult place to be when you are a woman who's passing as a man only being attracted to straight men because straight men only want to have sex with straight women. Right, right. but so, that, that's quite interesting because there's, what, what is the element there that it needs to be a straight man? What does that say about their ideas about gay men? Well, it means that they have a sexuality. It means that she's actually recognizing that she is indeed a woman. Right. And only wants to have, but, but there was an incongruence there, right? That she was only sexually attracted to men who she knows like to have sex with women, yet right. would not succeed in a romantic relationship. Oh, my you days. You understand now? Yeah, so by making the changes that she'd made, she's now made it impossible for the people that she wants to attract to be attracted to. <laughs> yes, yes. And that's not the case, obviously, for, for you know, in this case. Everyone, when, yes. You know, and this is Willow. She's been on my channel. She speaks very openly about this. She has her own YouTube channel. And um, it was just that part really, really fascinated me because, you know, the, the other side of it is, you know, the kind of like the homophobic undertones, mm -hmm. which, which leads women to, uh, you know, present as men, you know, in, in the world, you know, uh, yeah. you know, who are explicitly attracted to other. For some people, obviously, they might be attracted to, to someone and then they turn out to be a man or a woman. And they're like, oh, whatever, you know, and they find love together and it's like fantastic. Okay. Um, okay. Well, so you're bisexual even, really. But, right. Exactly. Yeah. That would mean that that person is bisexual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, you know, they then say that that in itself is something that you can't say. Um, Cause that's transphobic. But it, everything's transphobic. I mean, you know, um, if it works for them, great. You know, love each other, have fun together, you know, live your life kind of thing but why does everything everybody else have to be sucked into it it's like this black hole where now even in this conversation we're already trying to justify why we are straight or gay and like that's our sexuality it's like it, isn't it weird that a movement that says you cannot question identity you can't invalidate anyone and yet it's okay for them to turn everything upside down for everybody else. Mm -hmm. And then somehow we have to justify why it's okay to be ourselves. That's, that's just a weird thing. It's so weird. Like, how, how, it's like, don't they see that? How contradictory that is? Like, you can't question a man who identifies as a woman, but you can tell everyone that a woman is no longer a woman. That, that doesn't make sense. This is being played out in the sports world, right? Where this breakup, and you brought it up, Mano, about hearing the word cis for the first time. Oh. The idea that in courtrooms, in articles over and over again, when they're talking about what I want to see is the headline with all of these bills that are coming out across the country right now, that really the, the titles of these articles should read, you know, South Dakota or Mississippi or whatever decide to defend the rights of girls to have girls sports for girls. And what they do yes. is they turn it so that any reader and they say, you know, Mississippi is considering a ban on transgender girls. Yes. Yeah. And it's so, like, no, you don't know that the thing is, is that it's the sale. It's the sale of all of it, isn't it? We've talked yeah. about this a number of times. If you acknowledge what a woman is, it's transphobic. Yes. If you acknowledge what a gay man is, it's transphobic. Mm -hmm. So by that logic, it's anti-gay to be pro-trans. Mm -hmm. 
it's anti-woman to be pro-trans by that same logic because mm -hmm. it, it, it works both ways. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to point that out because if pro-woman is being anti-trans, they're being pro-trans is anti-woman. It's just the other side of the, of the equation. And I think we need to really keep focusing in on that. Why? Mm -hmm. Because, well, for example, in the Scottish Parliament last week, a bill passed, which is a hate crime bill that protects uh, a number of different types of people. So, for example, disabled people. Um, it uh, protects people on the basis of faith, Was uh, age, right? I think, uh, and obviously trans. But guess which one group? is not protected mm -hmm. or which what they call the aggravator, which aggravator is not included. Man, no, we're there. We know it's women. They're trying to eliminate sex, women. Sex. They've left but, out sex, but, not but obviously sex. women's sex. Exactly. Uh, and the categorization, this splitting up when I was talking about sports, this idea that there are cisgender athletes and trans athletes. It's, it's the division, and they're doing this again yes. in women's sports because we don't see that many women who are pretending to be men trying to get into sports. There are a handful, but not yeah. at all like what's happening with the takeover yeah. of women's sports because they're trying to annihilate the whole thing. We will soon not have any girls' or women's sports if they allow boys into everything, which they want to call transgender boys or transgender men. Of There's course, no but that's even that is an in-between stage because the next thing is to just call them men and women. And again, with that hate, hate crime bill in Scotland, there's a very strange loophole in that bill because sex is not acknowledged and therefore, you know, hate towards women based on the fact that they are female. If somebody now was to give hateful abuse to someone who identifies as a trans woman, but the abuser thought they were a woman, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that person who identifies as a trans woman would not be covered mm -hmm. with the protection of that bill mm -hmm. because the aggravator was misogyny or sex, right? Mm -hmm. Not transphobia. So that person wouldn't be covered. And then when that was pointed out in the debates before it passed, was that the guy who tabled the bill, Hamza Yusuf, he then said, well, it could also work the other way. So women are kind of protected as long as, you know, people mistake them for being cross-dressers or trans women. The only time that women are protected is when they're not acknowledged for being women. They have to scramble around to try to make something else happen. That's why I always said, if I get accused of anything around anything, I know it's not going to be... It, 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 I'm going to have to turn it into something where I can just simply say they did this to me because I'm trans. Who could huh. argue that? Who could argue that? Because if the they have talked themselves into a circle so that anybody can say Isabella could say she's trans. If somebody we're all trans. What? There's all of it. Mm -hmm. And because yet the they still claim that they are the most marginalized, oppressed, underserved, targeted, murdered population in the world. How could it be true that we are having a conversation talking about the various laws and protections that are being put in place specifically for men who identify as women, yet yeah. we are supposed to empathize with men who actively want to <laughs> invade women's spaces? I mean, it makes absolutely no sense. Well, it does. It's strategic. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. it, I mean, I often, you know, whenever I get to that point where I think this is insane, this is insane, I need to remember, remind myself, it's not, it's, it's all been planned, plan. because yes. these things are happening in different parts of the world, but at the same time, you know, the menstruation thing comes up at the same time in different mm -hmm. places, the sports thing is coming up at the same time, because it's being planned, and I think, Joey, that's something that you once said, it's like, you know, in terms of marketing campaign, we have to give them their props and say, you, you've really done a genius job. The genius and job, genius job. It, and if the internet had not been around, I don't think this would have gotten no. to any kind of scale that it has. It, it's got to the point where when a woman is on the cover of Time magazine saying, I've had a double mastectomy, although obviously they, they use very different words, 
You mean she's um, really fully who she is now? Then that would, that I'm fully who I am. I think that like, was the line on there. I'm even, people don't wince anymore, right? Because it's, it's normalized. It's like yeah. when I said to someone just yesterday, you know, because we talked about it and this friend goes, oh, but you know, we should all be themselves and everybody be free and happy. And who are we to judge? And I'm like, well, who are we to judge? We are, we are people with hearts and minds mm -hmm. and we have some level of common sense and we know what's what. Um, and it's like, if, and I said to them, look, what do you think about 13 year olds having double mastectomies? And this is not some kind of weird urban legend. You know, this is data from the LA pediatric unit run by, what's her name? Johanna Olson Johanna Kennedy. Olson Kennedy. Yeah. That's, that's her own data showing they had at least two 13 year olds who had double mastectomies. And this friend, well, what goes yeah well it's kind of concerning and i'm like i went into jennifer bielek mode and went concerning this is madness it's like the point that people don't even think it's mad anymore shows you how effective all this modern trends has been and spinning um the narrative of the most oppressed and in a way appropriating the experiences of the people who have really suffered, you know, who identify as trans, it's like they're capitalizing on those stories to spin this narrative of oppression. And I bought into that myself. Isabella, didn't you buy into that whole thing? Oh yeah, oh, for sure. I, I was a, I'm a recovering trans ally. I love that. We've got to come up with a word for what that is though. You know what? I think we need to have these meetings that are like AA meetings, but they're for- Not a TRA, but an RTA. <laughs> that's right, Joey, that's what I started. I started this eight week group series. I called it Liberal Feminists Anonymous, and I've been running it for eight months now. And it's an eight week journey. It's an educational program and support group for women who are interested in untangling the madness that is right. genderism, porn and prostitution, yeah surrogacy, all the mind fucks that we've been programmed into thinking are for the betterment of women and girls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it is like a recovery program. Also, when you've gone around spewing crazy stuff, like, you know, saying things like men can give birth or, you know, birthing people, birthing person, or you know, refusing to read a book by a woman because you heard that she was a terp and, you know, just crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's um, it's you have to un un undo that that wiring, I guess. And I, I think recovery is is a is a good word for that. There's one thing that guys that are now coming to me more privately, right? Not publicly, but they start messaging me privately. And mm -hmm. the the one thing that they keep saying is, I just feel like I'm going mad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you and brought up the this, gaslighting, the norm that that use of normalization that you brought up to the point now and going back to our sexualities our sexual orientations and all that is that this idea that tr anybody can be trans what that's done is made the erasure of gay male sexuality that you brought up earlier Mano, and right. le lesbians have already been a you know like an oppressed minority right it's you don't hardly hear our community's been wiped out i know that both gay men and straight women have benefited from the lesbian community G gay men during the aids crisis would not have been fucking anywhere if it hadn't been for lesbians that popped in to literally sit with and take care of and help out but but because lesbians are women we get forgotten we get squished down our voices are completely you know mashed out i think menno and why i got attracted to wanting to connect with you in the first place and and been wanting to have these kinds of conversations i think are really important because when you were in speaker's corner last september with posey and the standing for women and admitted and you did your apology to all the lesbians and this is the 2018 when get mm. the hell out and a number of lesbians literally laid their bodies down in front of the gay and lesbian parade there now pride parade and you said yourself 
you were annoyed when you found out that these lesbians had, you know, done this thing and you just wanted to get on with the parade. And when I talk to other gay men about this, it's a lot the same. They're like, oh, what are they doing again? You know, why are these lesbians doing this? We've always been on the forefront of political yeah. movements, whether it's the, you know, whether it's green, you know, the green, res deep green resistance stuff. I want to say the environmental, the anti-nuke movement all of these things where women have been killed like Karen Silkwood in the anti-nuke movement. And yet it doesn't matter because these things happen and they almost seem like these isolated stories. So even the young lesbians that are now on the internet and having to deal with their identities and trying to figure out their sexuality and any of that stuff, they're being sucked completely into this idea. It's not okay for a boy who likes other boys and he really knows that it's not okay he's supposed to just be open to everything and girls right. that feel attractions to other girls or even I, I think in the gaming world how they get attracted to certain characters or whatever they're being told oh you just want to be that person not that you're sexually or there's any kind of romantic or anything of an attraction you really need to be open to everybody. So if boys are being taught that and girls are being taught that, here's the part of the agenda is to break down our boundaries and our barriers, say, yeah. right? To open yeah. that up, who does that benefit? Pedophiles. And this is why we're seeing so many and we're wanting gay men to come much more forward and look at this just at a time. Here's another brilliant attack in this big architectural scheme of things. We've got gay men all over the world who are now renting women's bodies to have their babies and create their families. Once again, another place where women's bodies are being used about economics. It brings all that up. Radical, yeah. this idea of radical feminists and stuff have been on this for years, looking at the connections between surrogacy, prostitution, trafficking, all of that with sexuality, gay men, we really need gay men to start looking at this and not be selfish like in a country in Israel where the government is literally giving money to wealthy gay male couples to go rent women's bodies to have babies and create families. When you look at that and, and we see again, like you brought up about Ellen Page, Menno, we look at Elton John who else? We've got some, uh, you know, famous Americans now that have been yeah, into it. Anderson, Anderson Cooper. Cooper, Andy Cohen. It's you know, it, just during you know the beginning of the lockdown, uh, surrogacy was legalized in New York State. Jennifer Law was in New York, I think, really, really campaigning, really, you know, trying to just call attention to what was happening. But we were all distracted, you know, like all there's been so much anti-woman and pro-trans stuff that just has been like really stealthily relentless kind of put in especially this past year you know there, there's been a, a real uh, function to, to why it's been really strategic as to why that's happened particularly mm. here um because you know issues like surrogacy especially it, it, it isn't on most people's radar and and i i absolutely agree with you joey like ra you know obviously radical feminists have been on this for decades and you know, the, the normalizing that men can become women is, you know, to further normalize the buying and the selling of, of body parts. And we know whose body parts. We're not talking about men's body parts. We're talking about women's body parts, right? We right. We look at the nature of uh, sperm retrieval versus egg retrieval are vastly different. We know who is harmed and we know who isn't, you know, on a, on a kind of objective physicality what that process looks like for each party and mm -hmm. and I think you know even like men like Blair White you know kind of taking us through his like exploration of uh potentially using a surrogate is just it, it really pulls at the heart string strings of people who who really think this is just this whole trans thing is about equality well yeah. it, it's interesting when you mentioned body parts right obviously his bodies are affected as you said, very differently from men's. But again, this is part of normalizing that we are no longer, you know, it's like the question I've is like, 
what does it mean to be human and how is the body part of that? Because mm -hmm. I would say it starts with the body. Mm -hmm. um, but now it's like the body is just made to be this, this fleshy jacket that mm -hmm. you can refashion however you want. You can have the skin taken from your arm and stuck uh, to your groin and have your vagina sewn up. And then to help heal your arm, you have a flap of skin taken from your thigh and have that stuck back on there. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we have these these guys that have been on puberty blockers for a few years. And then when they get to 18, they want to have their uh, little willy changed into a, a so-called neo-vagina. But because it's so small, because of the puberty blockers, there's not enough literally raw material to work with. So our bodies are just becoming raw material and nothing more. So, but then the medical uh, industry goes oh we have a solution for that well we can cut this this guy open we can take a bit of his colon and stick that inside the the cavity that we've created so they have a solution for everything mm -hmm. right because there is this idiom of big pharma doesn't create cures it creates customers mm -hmm. and i think you were talking about buying and selling and there's a real element of capitalism what is the natural resource that we want to use human bodies there's one particular man in croatia a surgeon he's now making a name for himself as the reversal surgeon so he's got about 60 men on his mm -hmm. uh, waiting list or referral list who transition to become a woman mm -hmm. and regret it and want to go back but they've lost the junk right so right. he then has all these ways of of creating a, a, a fake penis. And again, it's, it's skin taken from the arm or from the back, um, but with a real penis like mine, mm -hmm. you know, elastic and it kind of changes size and shape and whatever as, as the blood flows into it, hurrah. <laughs> and you have an but, odor, you have an odor. There's a particular smell. Oh, that I've never that. been attracted to. <laughs> never. <laughs> Everything in my body is like, you know, right. But small. The point yeah. I want to make is, you know, my urethra expands mm -hmm. as my penis grows. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you try to create a, a so called, I don't even want to call it a penis because that's just offensive to me because again, it, it breaks. It, to call it that takes it, it just messes up the whole integrity of what a penis is and in order for that for, for them to be able to pee through that falsehood they need to have a urethra but the urethra is gone right in the first operation so they take the mucous membrane from inside the cheek or from the bladder and they need enough for it to be six inches long and then they somehow put that inside the flap of skin from the arm or the back. And I mean, just, just listening to myself saying this, this is just mad. Good this enough. Croatian guy, this is his dream work. Yeah. He loves it. And he has this vision. And it sounds like, you know, in James Bond, they always have Q who invents things. Yes. It's like, this is like a James Bond style Q. And he says it himself in like in a document. My dream is to create like a um, central bank of God because he said he had a number. I think it was over one and a half million people who go through this every year in Europe. Um, so he's like, if half of them are men and half of them are women and half of them are having hysterectomies, then we can somehow harvest these wombs and then we can store them somewhere and then we can use them in men's body. If they take away men's reproductive parts, if they can store them, they can then use them in, on women's bodies to get more, you know, to get better results. But Menno, um, this goes back to what you brought up earlier. And we were talking about Isabella's channel, you know, like whose body is it to really look at that? I mean, everything that you're saying about this is it goes back to Billick. It's commodification. We've talked this it's about. It's the commodification of the human body. And her, I, her, her line, it's capitalism, stupid. When people keep yes. saying, why is this happening? You're talking about this Croatian guy. Money, money, money. It's all. It must it's be funny. Stupid, and we always need to question why this stuff is happening. And there's been a narrative in the whole trans, the trans narrative is you don't question. 
you just accept and it's no yes. different than scientology yes and me bringing up to you isabella about we need these recovery groups and i didn't know i didn't know that you were doing that but i think about the people that escaped scientology and they are in their recovery groups that's been going on for a long time and i think about the detransitioners coming out and the thousand what we got like seventeen thousand or something detransitioners you know wanting to have their bodies back in a way or to get back to what they're normal their true right self and their true authentic bodies and that's where whose body is it it's ours each each of us ours and you can argue and say well then you should be able to do what you want with it whose body is it because you can say that it's yours on an individual level Yes. But there's a, there's, a, there's a bigger level where it's like, whose body is it? It's nature's yeah. in a way. Because nature, you know, our bodies work in a certain way that have nothing to do with how we feel about ourselves or mm -hmm. who we think we are as people or what our talents and our skills are. You know, we're digesting food while we're talking now. Um, our nails are growing. Our hair is growing. Um, I'm pumping sperm. You know, I'm... All this is just happening, right? And it, that's just... You know, Menno, that, that same claim, you know, like I've also heard really uh, like homophobic things around well, na nature. So, so if, if, if nature rules, then what about same-sex attracted people not procreating? If, if they're perfectly designed, you know, why are you pumping sperm then? You know, haven't you heard these like anti-gay... Claim. Of course, but yeah. that's that's a really ill thought through argument because everyone who is lucky enough to be fertile mm -hmm. doesn't come with. I mean, for women, it's different in different cultures, especially where they're being pressured by the family of you got to find a man and you got to give us some babies. Mm -hmm. um, but just because you are fertile doesn't mean that you you know someone's you have to reproduce right. and. I don't know why, I mean, I have no desire to have a child. I just don't. Um, and I don't know why I don't fall for women because I always find women the most interesting people and the most beautiful people. And all my favorite singers are women and all my favorite comedians have always been women. And I think they're much more intelligent. And when I see women do speeches in parliament, I'm like, wow. And then you hear a man and I'm like, <laughs> but, but I don't, I just don't fancy women. There it goes down to the chemicals, the pheromones that mm -hmm. Isabella brought up, everything about that. I've been like that since I was a little kid, you know, it's the same, it's the same thing. It's not just whose body is it, it's whose sexuality is it? How do we own and feel glad about the fact? Because I know, Isabella, that in, in this threesome here in our conversation, <laughs> you, you are the woman, you are the person, you're the human here, the heterosexual, who does fall. It's, it's a known thing that straight people are the majority in the world. I mean, when I used to be called and people would say something, oh, I'm sorry, I used the word minority for you. And I would just take it up and I'd say, I know I'm a, I know I'm a minority. That's fine. It doesn't mean that minority is a bad thing or isn't valid. Um, again, going back, I think of these words that I have used at different points in my life. And now that I'm using them a lot more and how they've been twisted and all this stuff. But the idea of just homosexuals and it's something that I, Menno and I, I believe that we share this Menno, you can correct me. There is such, from the time we were little, we knew that we were attracted to sex. How I that, didn't, I didn't. That's right. Oh, I remember now when you told me, Were, weren't you, weren't you, well, hold on. I don't want to reveal too much here because we've had these private conversations, <laughs> but when we look at, we talked about movie stars and singers and, oh, you told me how you felt tricked by divine to find oh. out that that was actually a man. And, yeah. and there were two men like that for you, right? Weren't you young when that happened with uh, RuPaul also? Yeah. yeah. So you, got, yeah. you got tricked, but it didn't mean that you were attracted to them sexually as a woman. No, I mean, wait a second. I mean, divine... Isabella, do you know Divine? No. He's too young. You'll have to go back and look at a movie called Pink Flamingos. 
Oops. But just in a nutshell, right? I was six years old and on TV was this, what I thought the, the weirdest character, you know, a woman. I thought a woman, really fat with huge hair and really over the top sort of punky makeup with a deep growling voice on a pop music show, you know, singing a song, don't stop doing what you're doing, don't stop, shoot your shot, rah, whatever. I, I, yeah. I was absolutely <gasps> fascinated. This, and I love the song and I love this, this fierce, awesome character, this woman. And then um, I was only six and my parents thought it was hilarious that I loved it because obviously my parents knew that that was a man called Divine. Um, it was just, I don't know, I was just absolutely drawn to, to Divine. And then um, one day I see the, the newspaper on the table and there was a picture that said that Divine has died. And there was a picture there of Divine as a man, like bold. Like, no wig, no makeup. And I just remember, I was six or seven going, hey, that's not Divine. If you're gonna put Divine in the newspaper, then at least have a picture of Divine. Who is this man? What? What? <laughs> this man, what? No, what? Where? Well, ah, ah. <laughs> And I felt tricked. Yeah, I remember that. I can imagine, you know, being a little girl the way that I used to look through Life Magazine and, and very neatly slice out pictures of Sophia Loren, all these different actresses. And I would put them on my walls, you know, in my bedroom. And I remember the very worried look on my mother's face. I'll never forget that when I was like, you're talking about six or seven and doing that through for a long period of time, I knew, I knew that what I was, was not okay. And in the era when I was growing up, there were anything that anybody had as a, it was considered homosexuality was literally in the DSM as a deviant behavior, as a deviant yeah. psychology, as a deviant everything. So I know I'm older than, than, than you, Manu, and you, Isabella, but the, that growing up with that kind of thing as a homosexual, and I know mm. that for men to be realized that they are homosexual. At what age were you, Menno, when you realized, oh, shit, this is what I am? Uh, for me, that was a very long, slow process. So I didn't accept it until I was in my early 20s, which surprises some people because I grew up in Holland and they're like, oh, it's so progressive. It's so wonderful. But mm. for me, it took a good eight years to wrap my head around it and to accept it and to not think I was an abomination, basically. There was a, even though I'm not Christian and I didn't grow up strictly Christian, that was a big factor for me. The fact that I thought that it was against God. Mm -hmm. it, even though like, you know, I'm not religious, <laughs> but, but at the time that was a big thing for me. Um, but I remember the first time I had a sexual thought about a guy mm. and I think I was about 16 mm. and I remember having the thought and as soon as I had it, I went, <gasps> no, 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 mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. disgusting. No, I didn't think that. I didn't just think that. Mm -hmm. So, and as I became more aware of, yes, I did feel attracted to guys. I still thought, oh uh, no, one day I'll meet a girl and, and then, you know, that's it. I'll just, mm -hmm. and there was a girl I met in Australia and, when I was 20 and we got on really well and she liked me. Mm. And I just thought, Oh, that's it now. Oh, I'm, I'm good now. Right. That other stuff will just disappear. But, but I, it was more the sense that a girl was interested in me, mm. which I hadn't really experienced either mm. before that. I was such, you know, I, I was like the, the never been kissed kind of guy mm. until mm. I was in my twenties. Mm -hmm. Um, you but will made no. up for that, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there is something that obviously that I experience being intimate with a man that you experience being intimate with a woman and Isabella, you experience being intimate with a man that it just is. And 
-hmm. And now we're sort of have to justify it or question it. And it's like, no, no, there is this one thing that I can only experience with men. Joey, you can only experience that with women. And it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. And there's a, again, a sacredness to it. When you're with someone and you have that thing where you just become, you know, fairy spice girls to become one. <laughs> there is a magic in it. <laughs> I had other songs in my mind, by the way. <laughs> I, have, I have movie clips all the time that go through my mind. But, I mean, and Isabella, it'd be interesting to see how you feel about this. Like when I say there's like a, a certain sacredness about it, that's when I feel if a female now starts identifying as a gay man and claims to be as much of a gay man as I am, that's where I'm like, well, no, now you're appropriating. And you're, it's like you're, you're, you're trying to take that sacredness, whatever it is, and you're trying to claim it as your own. Mm -hmm. But you can only do it by taking it away from me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the appropriation of everything really of the body and and of sexuality so for me this gets i find it very disturbing mm. yeah. how do you how do you guys feel about it guys sorry you have to girls be. ladies <laughs> please women uh, <laughs> what, what, what do you add on human add a human female add a human female well, yeah, I mean, I agree. It's totally reductive. It's offensive. It's delusional. Um, I feel like it, it's all those things. You know, I was interested, you know, we, we in previous conversations, we had talked about drag culture and, and how the distinction there is that everyone yeah. knows that focal point is pretend. It's a performance. And now I, 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 I personally find it quite offensive you know, any kind of like woman face at this point, you know, I'm looking at through the lens of like, how is this misogyny? How is this uh, permissible yes. misogyny really? Mm -hmm. um, but I was wondering if you would speak to, yeah, your involvement in kind of drag culture, drag community and ha how, how that shifted for you. Okay, so I was quite insecure as a guy, as a teenager, because I was so slim, I'm still very slim. Um, and because of that, I didn't feel like I was manly enough. And also I developed very slow. My puberty wasn't like the puberty of the other guys, right? In, in my year at, at high school, because they just suddenly from one day to the next had beards. And like, I, I was part of an athletics team. And once we, we were in an open shower kind of thing. Um, and, and I saw what they had between their legs and I was just like, whoa, 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 whoa. And then I looked at mine and it's just like, oh, well, well, is anything going to happen anytime soon? <laughs> and I don't know why, but it just, for me, was a very slow, gradual process. Like my voice never broke. It ne I never went through that <laughs> kind of phase. Again, it just, just like women's voices develop very slowly. So why that is, is I have no idea, but that's how it went. Um, so I felt very insecure about that. Um, and even until recently, I just always felt like, like a Peter Pan, like mm. someone who never quite kind of grows up or grows into manhood or being a man. It's interesting that this, you know, person who identifies as a trans man thought I was a trans man and not a man, right? Even there, this person picked up on something. Um, so I thought that drag was a way to, to get attention and to get people to say, you look amazing. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's validation in a way that I felt that I couldn't get just a guy because as a guy, I felt like a little, you know, weedy, uh, whatever, pudding Tarzan. Um, I, it also just on. occurred to me that it's a way for, potentially a way for gay men to get validation from straight men who are <gasps> secretly gay. You know what? That's interesting because for some gay men, getting a straight man is like the dream. Right. Because, which again, I may, maybe there's some internalized homophobia there that because they think that the straight man is, is the realest of men. Yeah. Um, which is interesting because some guys who identify as trans women, they don't want a gay man. They want a straight man because that for them is the ultimate validation 
that they are seeing to be a real woman. Um, just to take it back to the drag thing, um, for a few years I was active as an actor um, and I, I got typecast very quickly as just because of my facial features and, and my, my bone structure as a transvestite. And then because of that, uh, I got cast as a transsexual woman a few times, uh, even though at the audition, there were, we that, oh, sorry, there were, there were, there were men there who identify as trans women who were up for the audition against me, but I got the job <laughs> because I was daintier and some of them had had facial surgery. So there was just this surgery fight look about it, right? Or they'd had, um, implants put in their chest so it just and some of them they went for that porny look you know and it didn't fit the part mm -hmm. um so it's always been an interesting thing about you know where do i fit in and, and what is it that people see in me um so i played obviously i've been a transvestite i've been a drag queen uh, i've been a so-called you know trans woman uh, i've also played a trans man in a documentary that, oh, wow. that's, <laughs> that's what they call acting, right? It's, it's acting. Right. But in terms of drag, it's interesting because now that I've, you know, been speaking to women a lot more about that, how they view drag and they say that, you know, it's misogynistic and it's woman face. And I'm like, well, hold on a second. I thought the whole idea of gender is that gender is a social construct and that we should all be free to do whatever we like in terms of how we dress and how we present ourselves. So if a man wears a dress, fine if a man wants to wear makeup and feel pretty fine i mean that's what makeup is for to be pretty but if i was to do it i would never say that that then makes me a woman i think that's the difference um when i've done drag i've never i never used the word fish or fishy or serving fish which is used to say that somebody looks convincing like a woman i've never felt like a woman because that's just such a weird concept to me there was one guy one my makeup in a toilet somewhere classy and then after he did my eyebrows he stepped back and he looked at me and he said do you feel all woman and I was just like no because it's just me in a dress yeah. and whenever I did it and I only realized this recently if I talk too much just you know rein me in but I never used padding on my hips or my bum mm. and when I saw guys do that I always kind of felt weird about that because I thought well now that's weird to me because now, I don't know. That's a weird one for me. But men, I always thought. Don't you think the whole idea when were you going in the past with this and have you now thought that drag, why there's so many women that find it, as Isabella said, woman face, whatever this whole, it's. I can see it, but I think there's many, there's many different types of drag. If the drag queen knows that he's a man, which most of the time that that's obviously the case, the audience knows he's a man and most of them, they're just, I think it's also, also very much about being able to do things as a man that you're not allowed to do out of drag. Right. So it, it kind of gives a man freedom to explore these things, but also to give the middle finger to all these rules that as a man, you can't do this and you can't wear a dress and you can't be camp. Oh, really? Well, here we go. I am what I am. So in that sense, it can be, uh, to use a, an overused word, empowering. I don't think that whenever it's done, it's at the cost of women or as a statement about women or to take the piss out of women. I think, uh, you know, for, I have seen that happen. So I'm not gonna say that it doesn't happen, but I do think there's an element of drag that you could claim is actually gender critical. But what we're looking at now in society and this idea that so many gender critical people have gone against the notion of drag is because, I mean, they're not the gay men that they used to be in terms of our culture, gay and lesbian culture. Men were gay and they knew they were men and they were doing yeah. this and it was very campy and it was fun. Yeah. Just like I'm wearing a tie. Part of the reason I'm going off for a, for a, a business thing after this, but I was I was a dra I was in drag king contests as well. Right, because and if you say that men can't do this, drag, then you're yeah. also saying that women can't exactly. do drag. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Let's if there is a lot of fun to be had mm -hmm. with 
with gender bending, you know, right. the old school right. gender bending where it's fun and you're having but fun it's, and it's, it's creative bastardized. and it's playful. It's but now it's bastardized. Yeah. Yes. Like everything. Joey, I'm wondering if you would speak to like your experience of, of gender bending and what that meant for the women in your community. Oh, it's so ridiculous. It's like when Menno brought up about Ellen Page and the cover of Time, I just look at that and go, there is nothing about this that makes somebody, she's, I, I don't know if she's still even, like I said, going to call herself a lesbian. It's like Rachel Maddow. I've heard Rachel Maddow say, I dress, I'm a 30, well, she's more than 35 now. I remember this whole interview with Rachel Maddow. She said, I'm a 35 year old woman that dresses like a 14 year old boy. So the thing about where what Menno's talking about with drag, really with men wearing cross, we call it cross-dressing. I've been cross-dressing since I was a little kid, since I got out from under the pressure of my father who didn't allow any, you know, any wearing of pants out in public. I showed, I'd shared a photo with Menno a while back that I had a cowboy. A, I wanted a cowboy outfit really badly and I wanted to be able to carry a gun and have it be a visible <laughs> gun, right? And so I had an aunt and uncle and they bought me a they they bought me a cowboy outfit, but it was a cowgirl outfit. They had to, my father insisted if I was gonna get something like that, it had to be a skirt. I hated wearing skirts, but I wanted the outfit and I wanted the gun. So I have pictures of me, you know, at like barely five years old holding my stick pony and I have this you know cowboy outfit on and this skirt but I got this gun and it must be like it's huge they didn't have like a little kitty size gun but stuff like that I mean that was if I had had pants on like I know a lot of women straight and lesbian that had that wore outfits at Halloween a lot of times that were replicating workmen or whatever it was that it was about you know, things like that. But it's funny because for the majority of my career, I've been a house painter. And so wearing painter's whites and even becoming a boss and a supervisor and telling other men what to do on in a trade that involves so much about uh, careful detail, you know, in terms of painting. This thing that Mano said about, and I've certainly found a commonality with gay men particularly ones that are able to have enough boldness about them that they have been able to show a much more gender bending side, like they're willing to wear a little makeup or they're willing to do these things, you know, that would attract a straight man. And that was the prize, I think, as you said, Menno. I had a lot of that same thing. I was attracted to married women I was attracted to straight women because I didn't, one, I didn't have a community when I was really, really young. All the lesbians that I met when I was coming out at 16, 17, they were all much older than I was. And I was more attracted to women my age who were straight. There weren't any lesbians. So that kind of carried on for, for quite a while with me. Um, I don't know where that, where I was going with that, except that it brings up a part around sexuality and how do we develop our sexuality? So once you decide, you know, you're straight or you're gay or you're a lesbian, how is your sexuality then nourished if you're in a culture that wants you to hide everything that you are? You know, if you're just somebody who is desiring to be an artist and live as an artist and try to make a living as an artist, but you're a secretary. You have to squelch that a lot just to make a living and get by. So it's mm. very true with sexuality that is not celebrated. As a matter of fact, not just not celebrated, but it's vilified. And it creates a kind of a shame. And that shame gets acted out in the sheets. It gets acted out in the ways that we have sex, whether we're sneaking Sorry. in public, you know, or it has to be in private. We have to have the lights off. There are a lot of people keep their yeah. clothes on. I mean, yeah. think about stuff like that. I mean, it, that affects how. Or, or you don't talk. Or you don't talk. Don't. Or you have to talk, or you have to tell them things about how that are going to be humiliating, and they want to hear humiliating things, or they cannot be 
there, this affects all sexualities, right? So much of, of what goes on in our, even subconsciously, we act it out in a sexual arena. Yeah, and I think that whether it's religion that has possibly oppressed us or growing up with alcoholic parents or, you know, some other maybe harsh situations or really academic situations or whatever, the idea of being really connected to our sexuality, I think is a lot about how good do we feel about our bodies? How much shame do we carry? And do for, I have found very rare in my relationships throughout life, any women who don't carry a particular kind of shame in some way, and then have to navigate that and negotiate that a lot. And, um, I know that that's true with gay men. I know it's true with straight men, straight women. It's the, it's a human thing is shame and how we need to eliminate that to be able to fully appreciate what we have to offer somebody else. Because if we don't, we can't love our own bodies for the mechanics and the gifts that we have that we're born with. How are we going to give that to anybody else? Truly? Yeah. And I think with, with these younger kids, I call them, young teenagers, when they feel like they don't fit in and they think that that's because they are trans. And you get these girls, you know, and as, as we said earlier, the 13 year olds, 15 year olds that are having double mastectomies, their bodies haven't even developed and their sexualities haven't developed, their identities haven't developed, their brains haven't developed. There's so much that hasn't been developed. And it, like a 13, 14 year old girl who starts identifying as a guy and who likes guys, therefore thinking, oh, I'll just be able to get myself a relationship with a gay man. And it's like, have you, this is gonna sound weird. You've never even touched a penis. You don't even know what it looks like or what it feels like. And how, how can you, like for us to keep affirming that stuff for them, that's, I've, that I feel is harmful because we're setting them up for failure and disappointment and heartbreak. There was one story that um, Graham Linnan had told me where apparently this, this, this woman who identifies as a gay man went to a sex party where all the gay men were just like, what are you doing here? And she was surprised. Ugh. It's really heartbreaking. It really is heartbreaking when you think about stories like that. And then also the potential violence that, you know, that, that comes with deception, like sexual deception. Obviously this happens, you know, mostly within prostitution, but um, yeah, like, like how people react to being deceived can sometimes be violent. And, and there's absolutely no excuse yeah. ever for violence against uh, anyone who identifies as trans, you know, and yes, what, what is that phrase? Is it, is it trans panic? Is that the word where men go ballistic if they find out that what they thought was a woman turns out to be a man? There's a word for it. Uh, and they use it in, I think they've used it in court as a, oh, well, that's why, you know, which I'm not saying that I think that is a right defense to use at all because obviously no one should experience violence. Yeah. Um, but there have been a couple of, court cases where women who, who identify as trans men and they've been on testosterone and whatever else enter into sexual, you know, intimate situations with women, but it's all in the dark. And then they use a dildo, but the woman doesn't know it until the woman goes, whoa. So there's a couple of examples where where these women who identify as men have, have been um, convicted. Wow. Because, you know, then again, where do you draw the line between, because they had sex consensually, but the woman thought she was having sex with a man. Any, anyone who is affirming these delusions is now participating in yes. sexual coercion, incidental violence. I mean, it is like everyone is participating on this. I mean, I think about the women who are so convinced that they are men who go to men's bathrooms thinking that they're safe. Right. And similarly, there was someone in the States, 
I can't remember where exactly in the States, but again, a woman who identifies as a man was arrested for something and absolutely wanted to be put in with the male prisoners because that's part of the identity, right? And it has to be affirmed. Whereas, and yeah, they, and they put them with the females and they kicked up a big fuss and I think they were transferred to the men's. But yeah, obviously with men in prison, you're not going to be safe. It's all about affirming the, every woman, the identity. Every woman who, I mean, I think we do need to hold women accountable to some level for this, you know, who are identifying as men. Every woman who insists that she should be included in men's sports or in men's prisons, which I think is, is quite rare, right? That's, you know, not what we're seeing by far and large. We're seeing men insist on being included in women's yes. sports and women's spaces. Yeah. For every woman who thinks that that's for the betterment of trans people, puts back women's rights yeah. by about a hundred years. I mean, this is insane. It, it really, it undermines male violence. It's a complete denial of male violence against women. It's a complete denial of any kind of physical distinction between men and women. And yeah. it, it completely undermines all that we Everything. know. Everything, everything. It's mm -hmm. like the, the rug of reality is pulled from under now, underneath everything. And there's an, um, an article that I've written for a, a website called Lesbian and Gay News, where I call it the, the accidental camp of trans activism. So I'm particularly looking at a branch of trans activism and comparing it to very camp movies that gay men have taken to heart. Um, and sort of looking at why do these movies appeal to gay men and therefore why are some of these gay men just as equally supportive of trans rights without seeing how they are cheerleading their own way into homosexual erasure and they're throwing women on the, under the bus? Like what's creating that blind spot? So as I was in researching that, I thought what's interesting here is that, see with drag, sometimes women have said to me, but women don't act like that. And I'm like, well, that's the point. They're not a woman, they're being a woman. It's the idea, right? It's the styling of woman. Um, it's the performance of woman that they're portraying. The performance of a man's idea of a woman. Exactly. So that's why I say woman, not woman. What trans does, it, it, takes, the, it takes the quotation marks, but shifts them from the subjective to the objective. So sex now becomes sex whereas gender be gender becomes gender and this is a massive inversion where everything that we knew to be true is now an interpretation and therefore an identity whereas everything that is subjective and individual is now somehow sacrosanct you can't question it and that's how everything gets turned upside down. And I think this is where we kind of feel similar, where we feel like, hey, hold on, there is an integrity to the body. There is an integrity to your life. There is an integrity to your language. And that's all being ripped apart. So now we have females talking about what it means to be a gay man. Yeah. Similarly, we have males talking about what it feels like to be a woman, but the woman, they now take literal. Well, this idea- Does that though, make sense? Yeah, does to me. With Isabella being in, you know, coming from the birthing movement like that, you started to bring up those words. I mean, I know that they've been thrown around in the gender critical community, but I'm starting to see more mainstream people question cervix haver. It goes back to, humans just being body parts right it goes back to that idea of commodification so because once you've commodified the human body you can capitalize on it but obviously we're not just going to go hey it's like with kidneys you know obviously there's been a trade in kidneys for a while also there's an ethical side to it like how does this affect people in poorer communities this is why we get into talking about surrogacy prostitution right pornography everything and that women in general, throughout the world, have been second class and economically deprived.
But this thing about going back to body parts and whatnot, when I was saying, um, talking about Isabella and being a, a birth worker, yeah. what I'm starting to notice is that more people who are, have no zero sense about, they haven't even heard the phrase gender critical. Yeah. I'm experiencing this because I'm working with a lot of parents lately who are ROTG parents, GD parents. And so they have children who are presenting as trans just out of the blue. We're not about presenting. They're saying that they are, they're, they're claiming that they feel like trans, but they don't even know what it is. Right. So these are yeah, parents yeah. Who are experiencing kids. A lot of them are teenagers that are either ready to leave the house or whatever they're they're If they don't get their way, you know, it's, it's all kinds of crazy stuff. But anyway, a lot of these parents that I've been relating with, many have been religious and there are a lot that have been just super liberal and, you know, never involved in any, you know, religious groups or anything like that. But the commonality is, is that a lot of these people have never been politicized. They don't pay attention to the same things that a lot of people who like me have been activists and we started to kind of keep certain ears out and certain directions for things. So they haven't even heard of gender critical. Now yeah. their child is rejecting them. Their child is claiming this identity or whatever that they've never even hardly heard of. They are becoming swarmed the erasure of females, what's yeah. going on with this idea you know, it's the language and what we brought up earlier which is the normalization of words that's the thing that's really yeah. important. if we all believe that there's this big design that this is an agenda and that this is a very well or orchestrated attempt at attacking all human beings for body parts for experimentation for money for what is it transhumanism we're looking at all of these possibilities why this is going on but meanwhile, words like chest feeding and the idea oh. that even the concept that a woman who is pregnant, but she looks like a man and she's maybe standing in a photograph next to a man who's looking like a woman. And now we've got, in essence, visually a heterosexual couple. Yeah. And in reality, it is a heterosexual couple. I don't care what they've done yeah. with their body parts. But the fact is, is that it's the woman that's pregnant in that relationship. And now she's what? Yeah. Father? And more people are looking at this stuff and it's almost like a gift that I think. It's sort of like in the United States where we've just had one of the biggest autogynophiles take, he's going through confirmations right now, he's probably going to be fine, you know, become the health secretary. This is, you know, people aren't saying what this stuff is out loud they're not saying it and for the first time ever um somebody did that the other day on a national television show where they said dr levine is an autogynophile autogynophilia is related to a sexual fetish and here we have somebody in the upper levels of government in the united states who clearly looks looks like a man i go back to uh, mad tv you know he looks like a man couldn't have been a bigger gift for straight people and people like these parents that I'm dealing with that are going, what is going on? Wait a minute. If we get these more obvious people like, you know, Dr. Levine, clearly a man, people know that. It's like we were talking about the idea of sexuality being something about pheromones and everything, particularly for women who are hyper aware from the time that we're tiny girls we fear rape. We learn about rape and we learn about male violence. And it's something that we grow up with. And particularly for women, once they hit puberty, they start breast development. And now it's been happening with girls, what, Isabella, as young as 10 and 11, instead of the normal starting to have periods at 13, 14 in my generation. Now it's like it could be 10, 11, 12. And this thing about double mastectomies happening it's going to go into body parts and stuff again. I only learned two years ago how important it is for women and girl, girls to keep their breasts, how much development comes from the breast is, that's glandular material that affects right. brains. It affects everything, everything. And this is, you know, not just for potentially feeding offspring, but for overall health and well being, regardless of how you procreate. I knew that Isabella, you had approached me a long time ago and I told you, I don't wanna do this until, you know, there's something else that's really been different, big. And one of the things that 
I see lacking in all of these YouTubes that there's so many people, they, they, you know, they just sit at the camera and they're just doing stuff. What I appreciate about your channel are these long form conversations <laughs> that get really deep into different things. And that is why I had brought up the idea about having a discussion with two sort of, you know, this, this older lesbian who's become friends with a gay man who I saw back in September was somebody that I thought this guy is right on the brink of really exploding. And he's, you know, he's brought so much joy to my life and activism. And I, and I feel like I've watched the development of somebody really becoming an activist and that we are, that Menno and I now have reached this level where we're, I mean, we're, we're on the same level a lot looking at these different issues because things have been coming, as you said, Isabella, fast and furious during COVID. And whatever stage that we are at, it's a good place to have these conversations. And I have been wanting gay men to jump, you know, get their, get their eyes off their dicks seriously and look at what is going on because their sexuality is being attacked. That's why I want to say to you. Know, thank you. I wanted, that's it. That's why I wanted to do this. Thank you. You're one of the rare ones and you're turning other men on. And that's how we do it. One by one. These relationships. Well, if you need to turn men on, you just wheel the men out. <laughs> Hope I still can still weave my magic. Um, well, Joey, thank you. I mean, obviously, you reached out. You know, if if it hadn't been for you, obviously, things may have developed very differently. In my end, mm. because I wouldn't have had that. Um, you're like an anchor, you know. Mm. Mm. Um, and I guess what I have to say to gay men is like, I know you want to be kind and nice and you don't want other people to experience the sort of shit that gay men and lesbians have experienced, but don't let that blind you to what's really going on. Cause at the end of the day, as a gay man, when you want to get some dick or bum fun, you know where to go. So stop pretending, I guess is my message. And I'm, I'm getting a bit tired of having to have all these conversations with gay men, it's just like, come on, you know what a man is. You know, because you are one. And you also know what a woman is because you were born of one. So stop pretending. So I feel a bit more like going in with a bit of a, I don't know, a yeah. tougher approach rather than all this, oh, try to understand where they're coming from. And oh, that, that. No, you know what a man is. Stop it. it. Reminds me of a recent footage of the deprogrammer going around in a car in New York right after the protests happened and yelling in a, out, out, just yelling out to the streets. And this was filmed, um, screaming out, you know, trans women are men. We all <laughs> know, everybody knows what a woman is. And it's like, what a freedom to yell that out in the streets, you know? Yes. At the point where I think we are, it is a clarion call for all of us to stop this bullshit and stop thinking that there's anybody that is true trans because they've done some body modification or they've taken enough, you know, hormones to change all those second, you know, characteristic sex markers. No, no, it's time we stop that. We stop platforming people like that and we get together. And we must. And I think that's, that's, it's, it's not an exa exaggeration when you say safe another generation because the more younger people get sucked into this idea that their bodies aren't really their bodies yeah. and that it's just things that that you can be this pick and mix human right i want that body part i want that party part i can have this made out of that and i can have that i mean if i have my foot chopped off and stuck to my head and call it a crown it's a foot stuck on my head right that sounds what like a new, new, a real yeah, an image. Would that catch on? <laughs> <laughs> We've just planted a terrible, terrible seed. <laughs> oh no, I'm sure there's a surgeon who'll jump onto it. Oh, I'm <laughs> sure. Get yourself a crown. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, and that's why we have to affirm what's real. A woman is an adult human female. A man is an adult human male. A lesbian is a female homosexual. Man, oh, let's do it. A woman is a woman and a man is a man. A man is a man, a woman is a woman and a man is a man. <laughs> and it's, but also, it's like when people say that they've had surgery and they've had 
their penis surgically inverted into what they call a vagina. And they, they say this, it's a fully functional vagina. Yeah. It's like, hold on a second. It's nothing, nothing. You can't make a vagina out of penis. End of. Nope. Similarly, a, a, a flap of skin from your arm is not a penis. Mano, there was Isabella didn't know she was going to get a musical with this too, okay? <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing it. like a dick. I love nothing it. Nothing in it. the world. <laughs> well, you know, I think, I, I think, well, first of all, thank you so much for, for both of you for, for having this conversation. I, I, I know that this conversation will peak a lot more people. Yes, I hope you're right. Even if one person gets peaked out of this, even if one young person sees this and says, oh, I get that now. And they stop from puberty blockers, wrong sex hormones, surgeries, because what Paige just did, what that actress mm -hmm. Ellen Page just did, thousands, hundreds yeah. if not thousands of young women from around the world are gonna see that. Time Magazine, shame on you. Shame on you if you're watching this. Anybody from Time Magazine, you just, no, I can't. Well, what, what they're doing is they're glorifying self-denial as authenticity. Yeah, yeah. And this is, I think, for me, at least in this conversa conversation, the thing that keeps coming back is the idea of what is authentic? What is, what is the integrity? What is real? Mm -hmm. And if your authenticity depends on medical treatment, and surgical modifications to your body, then how authentic is it? If your authenticity depends on coercing others to call you certain things, how authentic is it? Real authenticity takes a while to discover in yourself as a person. Some, sometimes it takes decades to really get to know who you are, but it's not just who you are, it's what you are. And I'm five foot 10. I can't identify out of that. Mm -hmm. That's just what I am. I'm a white man. I didn't ask for that. That's just what I am. And I'm, I'm a man. I'm male. I'm just what I am. Whereas with the identity craze, it's all just about subjective ideas. And it's like, that's not how, there is more to you than what you think about yourself. There's more to life than your life story. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to, it, there's a humility that's gone out the window and now there's an arrogance that has re replaced it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, this, so therefore it's true and you must believe it. You can't question it because then you erase me. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that just goes to show how solid it is. Yeah. Real authenticity comes from the inside, not from pills, not from testosterone injections and not from surgical procedures. So love yourself Learn to love yourself truly as you are. That means accepting yourself for all the things that are wonderful about you and all the things that may be a bit shit. But, you know, that's all part of the package. Well, I will tell you that I've had a number of young women, uh, let's see, lesbians, who've seen me on other YouTube stuff and talking about my journey. I have a number of women that I just, because of survival and everything, I don't have the time to be able to really, they've asked me to be a mentor I'm dealing with two. That's what I can do now because these are long journeys. But there are groups, there are things, whether on social media, find other older women and older gay men who've lived their lives, who, mm. as Menno said, it takes a lifetime sometimes to discover who you really are. And we just and we, to learn to appreciate to, yeah. to learn to appreciate yourself it's all part of the package it's all part of the package of self-love it takes a long time capitalism is all about you want something now you go and get it it's this whole instant culture and now it's that's being applied to how we get our how we deal with ourselves as humans it's like oh i feel uncomfortable oh i have dysphoria oh i need to get testosterone boom isabella thank you thank you isabella we'll have to do a a follow-up conversation for sure.